Bubo's plegum blood and guts, boils bogies rot and pus, blisters, fevers, weeping sores, from your wounds the fester pours. A chant sung by plague bearer demons during battle. Nurgle, also known as the Plague Lord, Grandfather Nurgle, the Plague God, the Lord of Pestilence, the Fly Lord, Plague Father, and the Lord of Decay, among many other honorifics, is the Chaos God of Disease, Decay, Despair, Destruction, Death, and Rebirth. In particular, the emotion of despair in mortals empowers the plague god more than any other. Nurgle was the third of the Chaos Gods to fully awaken within the warp, emerging during the second millennium in the midst of Old Earth's European Middle Ages as great plagues swept across the world, heralding the god's birth. It is the Chaos God most directly involved with the plight of mortals, particularly humans, who suffer so acutely from a fear of death, perhaps the oldest fear of that species, or any other for that matter. While Nurgle is the god of death and decay, it is also the god of rebirth. Decay is simply one part of the circle of life, without which no new life could grow. In the same way, Nurgle is also the god of perseverance and survival. While those who wish to spread decay and corruption are certainly amongst its followers, there are also those who wish to endure, to become resilient enough to handle the difficulties and opportunities presented by an uncaring universe. Many of those affected by its poxes usually turn to the god in order to escape the pain and sheer despair caused by sickness and disease. Nurgle is the great lord of decay and the master of plague and pestilence. All things, no matter how solid and permanent they seem, are liable to eventual corruption and death. Even the process of creation is but the precursor to destruction and decay. The bastion of today is tomorrow's ruin. The maiden of the morning is the crone of the night. And the hope of a moment is but the foundation of regret. Though Nurgle is the ultimate creator of every infection and epidemic to have ever swept the universe, Nurgle is not a morose purveyor of despair and gloom, but in fact a vibrant god of life and laughter. In death there is life. Upon the decay of the living, Untold numbers of bacteria, viruses, insects, and other carrion feeders thrive. All life feeds upon other life to exist, and from every plague grows new generations, stronger and more virile than those who came before. Regeneration comes from decay, just as hope springs from despair. The greatest inspiration comes in the darkest moments. In times of crisis, mortals are truly tested and driven to excel. To understand what might otherwise seem contradictory or even perverse in nature, one must first comprehend that which Nurgle embodies. On the one hand, 
He is the Lord of Decay, whose body is racked with disease. On the other, the god is full of unexpected energy and the desire to organize and enlighten. The citizens of the Imperium know full well that their lives will end one day and that many of their number will live with disease or other torments in the meantime. Yet they drive this knowledge deep into the corners of their minds and bury it with dreams and ceaseless activity. Nurgle is the embodiment of that knowledge of mortality and the unconscious response of all sentient beings to the knowledge of their own ending. It is the hidden fear of disease and decay, the gnawing truth of mortality and the power of defiance that it generates. Every single human being in the galaxy has been touched by its footed hand at some point. Countless trillions are host to its malignant, invisible creations which corrupt their physical forms and so despair in their minds. Interplanetary traffic ensures that contagious diseases are carried from world to world by the ignorant, the willful and the strong. As Nurgle's gifts multiply in full-blown pandemics, its power reaches a peak. Whole star systems, even whole sectors are quarantined as plague runs rife across the stars. Proud civilizations wither away even as Grandfather Nurgle conjures obscene new life from their remains. Wherever there are plague pits and mass graves, the rotting splendor of Nurgle shines through. Despite its consistent generosity, only an enlightened few truly embrace Nurgle's greatness among humans and aliens. Yet the gods' worshippers exist in numbers enough to ensure his demon servants access to the material dimension wherever plague abounds. Of all the Chaos Gods, it is Nurgle who most appreciates the personal touch. Its sacred number is seven. Its colors are those of rot and ruin, waste and vomit, mucus and pus. The plague god is represented by the colors of green and brown, generally the most putrid variations of each. Nurgle also embodies the will of mankind and other intelligent species to struggle on no matter what opposes it, albeit perversely. Suffering, death, pain, human beings push these things from their minds and try to forget them by living in the moment in the hope that the future will be a better one. For this reason, Nurgle, its demonic plague legions and mortal followers usually demonstrate a disturbing joy at the pestilence that their god inflicts, seeing the plagues as gifts and the cries of their victims as gratitude for the strength to overcome the obstacles of a mortal life rather than agony. The Plague Lord is often referred to as Grandfather Nurgle, Father Nurgle or Papa Nurgle by his followers because of this hideous paternal stance. It has recently been uncovered by the Eldari Harlequins that Nurgle is in possession of the Eldari Goddess Isha, whom it rescued from Slanesh's clutches and imprisoned her within its realm in the warp. Nurgle utilizes her for his experiments, creating new contagions and diseases to spread into the material universe. With her divine powers of healing, Isha quickly regenerates from these tests, 
although Nurgle gleans what information is desired from the temporary effects. It is said that, secretly, she whispers the cures to those diseases to the mortals of the universe. Nurgle is one of the four major chaos gods of the Materium. He is most commonly called the Lord of Decay, but is also known by countless other titles and names including the Fly Lord, the Plague Lord, the Great Corrupter, and the Master of Pestilence. The power of Nurgle is ultimately embodied in entropy, morbidity, disease, and physical corruption. Of the four great ruler's powers, Nurgle is said to be the one most involved with the everyday lives of mortals. Through the gifts of raging fevers and shaking chills, its hand is upon them from cradle to grave. Few mortals escape its touch in their lives. The Plague God is sometimes called the Lord of All, because all things, no matter how strong and secure, fall to physical corruption and entropy in the end. Every Chaos God embodies within the Immaterium the hopes, fears, and other strong emotions generated by mortal beings in real space. In the case of Nurgor, their fear of death and disease is the source of his greatest power. The mortal's unconscious response to that fear their desperation to cling to life no matter the cost gives Nurgle an opening into their souls. The whispered prayer of a parent over a fever-struck child, the anguished pleas of the dying man for one more day of life, these are meat and drink to it. The power of Nurgle waxes and wanes as its pandemic sweep across the galaxy. When untold billions fall prey to the newest plagues, the Plague God's strength can overshadow that of any of the other Chaos Gods, even Korn for a period. At other times, the power of Nurgle withers away to lay quiescent until circumstances are ripe for it to erupt forth once more. There is nothing in all of creation that does not decay. No civilization forever endures the machinations of its rivals. No king survives the plotting of his enemies. No life avoids decay. Not even what Chaos considers to be the false emperor with all his deluded sacrificial supplicants and thousands of attending tech priests will elude the ravages of time and his eventual demise. The question is, what happens when the end comes? Nurgle is the answer to that question. Each inevitable ending brings with it an equally certain start to something new. When a Katachan spiker traps and consumes a careless Imperial Guardsman, the life of the soldier ends and a new spiker grows. Rotted flesh that sloughs from the arm of a diseased underhive ganger is left in the sewers to feed the plague rats that scrape out a miserable existence in those dark, maggot-filled tunnels. Even a rogue trader whose contract is terminated must seek out new avenues for commerce. There is no ending 
that does not result in the hope of renewal. It is because of this inescapable fact of life that Nurgle is known to many as the Lord of All, for there is nothing that transpires anywhere that does not serve its ends. There is no being, no action or outcome that does not further Nurgle's aims. In truth, it could simply sit back and wait for the universe to unfold according to its design. Nurgle is not content, however, to wait. It has too much energy, too much enthusiasm for its work to just sit idly by. From deep within its mans, it brews contagion, both physical plagues and virulent ideas, that it and its followers then unleash upon the mortal realm. It welcomes the resistance of those who attempt to deny it, for each time they erect defenses against its advances, it learns new ways to circumvent the opposition. Each cure breeds a newer, more powerful disease. Every victory for its enemies is Pyrrhic, coming at a cost so great that it leaves the defenders open to the tender predations of Nurgle's ever-evolving poxes. This is the nature of it. Resistance is self-defeating. Change is a delay, nothing more. Running and denial only buy time at a cost of suffering, and time has no meaning in the realm of chaos. Records of the many sentient species of the galaxy often say that Nurgle corrupts, that he brings ruination to all. To a small extent, they are correct, but their evaluation is narrow in scope and fails to grasp the greater truth. The more primitive races have a much better understanding of the undeniable nature of the master of certitude. Life is struggle and erosion. To face the dawn is to await the dusk and, in turn, to endure the night. On a grander scale, if a being had the luxury of observing the rise and fall of empires, of seeing the birth of suns and their eventual collapse into swirling masses of cosmic destruction, the observer would surely recognize the rightful place of Nurgle as the Shepherd of Destiny. It is only Nurgle's fondness for rot, for the unpleasant nature of disease and decay, that prevents more from accepting its truth. It can be difficult for a mortal to accept that the rotting of a limb or the expulsion of their entrails is indeed a blessing, and yet it is so. Even the decrepit and decaying form of the Emperor of Mankind, ensconced in his golden throne, sits as a testament to Nurgle's greatness and its truth. Each day a thousand souls give their fleshy bodies and immortal souls to this false idol in a vain to attempt to preserve his rotting presence. It is a losing battle, but the ammunition spent in the conflict the human body sent to their wasted doom does indeed serve a purpose. Nurgle's purpose. Each mortal that falls begets new life and new hope. This is the trade in which Nurgle traffics. Flesh is the coin of its realm, and hopes are the interest it pays on the investments made. Truly, 
Nurgle embodies the nature of all things, and thus earns its honorific as the Lord of All. Its Manifestation I gazed at its magnificence, my vision completely filled with its glorious girth. All around me was flesh and smiling flies. Within its bulk I spied lesser minions suckling on its leaking entrails. At its feet, pools of pus and other bodily fluids gathered, in which its children splashed and played with glee. It was a blessing to behold such glory and joy. It was with great sadness that I awoke into a world filled with imperial dogma and admonitions. I knew then the path I must walk. Taken from the Journal of Ulberna When it comes to understanding the glory that is the physical form of the Plague Father, those who are privileged enough to be able to read about the god in the pages of secret texts hidden away in the Black Library are on equal footing with the primitive warriors gathered around sooty bonfires within the wandering kill-cruiser battleships of marauding orcs. Nurgle, like the other major chaos gods, does not have one single form that can be recorded, shared, analyzed, or conceived. It is majesty unfathomable by the mortal mind. Additionally, Nurgle is often referred to as a he with the masculine gender, though in fact, like all the other entities composed of psychic energy called Chaos Gods, it in fact has no gender. Still, if one were to delve into the comparative histories and galaxy-wide myths associated with it, certain commonalities would present themselves. Whereas other gods within the realm of chaos are associated with dozens, even hundreds of depictions, there are far fewer variations on the appearance of the Plague Father. The legends and tales universally describe Nurgle in unflattering terms. It is said to be an immense, bloated humanoid its body swollen with putrefaction, its skin is shown as leathery and necrotic, its surface poked with running sores, swelling buboes and oozing wounds, internal organs bulging with decay spill through splits in the ruptured skin to hang like bunches of scrofulous grapes around its vast girth. It is a vast mound of rotting flesh, with open sores and gaping wounds in which its lesser demonic minions like Nurglings, cavord and Frolic, bursting forth from its postules and suckling upon their dripping foulness. Weeping postules ooze filth, and its bowels constantly issue forth putrescent waste. Its sickening, pus-covered form is accompanied by an enveloping cloud of buzzing flies. Beneath its fingernails, maggots and other carrion feeders lay eggs around which develop cysts that periodically burst open and spew their rancid payloads. Perhaps the tales are correct, perhaps they are not. It does not matter though, because whatever dwells within the mansion at the center of the Garden of Nurgle, there can be no denying that the creations of this being are both foul and wondrous. 
and the joy with which it goes about its work is infectious. Even if none of the insanity-inspired stories of Nurgle can be counted on to be perfectly accurate, the similarities among them are too hard to dismiss, and those similarities extend beyond the gut-churning descriptions of its open sores, exposed intestines, and stupefying stench. Rots and decay are part of its nature, but so it seems are jocularity and enthusiasm. Such is the paradox of Nurgle. Indeed, it may be its boundless energy, the passion with which it delights in its work, and its irrepressible joviality that erodes the minds of so many who contemplate its existence. It seems impossible to believe that a rotund-footed purveyor of plague and ruin could simultaneously positively beam with mirth and have such concern for the billions of souls upon whom it inflicts its racking and hideous poxes. To bend the mind toward the task of reconciling such foulness with such frivolity is to invite madness. Those who are able to do so without slipping into lunacy are fortunate. They will have taken an important step toward understanding the great corruption that is to come. Unlike their less enlightened brethren, they alone will recognize that the Plague Lord is a tireless gardener of rot, who is always trying to prepare the slowly eroding realm they call reality for its grotesque apotheosis. Its Philosophy and Methods its enemies shall wither and die, its allies shall wither and die, the universe and all within it shall wither and die, and when the great corruption has settled over the land and permeated the very foundations of reality itself, then shall the Lord of all rise from the rot and ruin, spread its arms wide to reclaim all its dutiful children. From The Victory of Rebirth A Litany of Inevitability Though they strive to embrace each day of life left to them, to forestall the inevitable, those who serve Nurgle must accept their eventual death. They must also believe in the equal certainty of rebirth. This hope for something new and glorious is the great comfort that the Plague Father has shared with them. It is a hope born from Nurgle's own understanding of the workings of the universe, just as its followers have accepted the teachings of their lord, Nurgle itself long ago accepted that decay brings an end to all things, but that through such decay, life begins anew. Decay is the victor in all battles, the opposition to which there is no resistance. This is why Nurgle embraces decay as a weapon, as a tool, as a means of instructing and guiding his followers. Decay is at the core of its philosophy and methods, blessed with reshaped forms and renewed purpose. The minions of Nurgle become its instruments in its ultimate purpose, the great corruption and ultimate reshaping of the universe. As vessels and embodiments of decay, mortals and demons alike are effectively living fuel, 
powering the great cycle through their actions and indeed their simple rotting infectious presence in the realm of chaos and on the mortal plane. Decay is glorious. Few who pledge themselves to Nurgle do so in the belief that it offers an easy path to power and glory. It does not promise increased influence, brutal strength or hedonistic excess like its fellow gods. Those who turn to it for aid are not seeking to make their dreams become reality, to strike down those who stand in opposition, or to be adored by all who know them. No, most mortals who find their way into Nurgle's footed embrace wish only for an end to some sort of suffering. They call to it to protect them from the ravages of disease, to save them from the slow, painful death of unchecked infection, or to otherwise spare them from whatever may ail them. There are even some who do not seek it out, but are instead visited by one of its messengers and offered a bargain. No matter if they sought its gifts or if they themselves were found, the exchange is never quite what was expected. These mortals have their doubts and fears cast aside. They find that they are no longer caught in the paralyzing grip of despair and misery. Their afflictions, however, linger and are usually joined by other blight. New sores and pustules appear, the foul liquids they contain becoming home to small worms and maggots. Bellies swell and distend, the flesh straining to contain bleeding entrails that push the abdomen outward. Old wounds rip open again spontaneously and invite fresh infections. Whatever diseases or weakness these mortals once sought to leave behind, take up permanent residence within their bodies and minds. All this must be accepted as the first lesson Nurgle teaches. Decay is inescapable, but also glorious. This knowledge is illuminating for those who follow Nurgle. If all things decay, each moment is a gift. Why not use these moments to shape what is to come and secure a place in it? Why sit idly by, wallowing in pain and sorrow, when there is so much to do and so little time in which to do it? As these thoughts race through the minds of the newly converted, it dawns on them. Their pain is deadened. Even with so many new afflictions, so much rancid corruption of the flesh, the suffering has abated. Hope arrives. For these newest of Nurgle's adopted children, it is as if the morning fog has lifted and they see the world clearly with fresh eyes. Why had they complained about their poxes and failing bodies? What selfish desire to change their fates had prevented them from realizing their true purpose? Rot, glorious rot, becomes the constant companion for a servant of the Lord of All, instructing them, guiding their path, and reminding them that they are fortunate beyond measure to have been chosen by Nurgle to receive its gifts. Indeed, many discover that the initial malady from which they suffered the one that drove them to seek salvation in the first place was actually originally bestowed upon them by Nurgle. Rather than anger, it is joy that springs from this knowledge. 
These mortals believe themselves to have been chosen, destined for greatness as a true champion of Nurgle. The Champions of Decay Relatively few of those who receive Nurgle's glorious blessings distinguish themselves as much more than a tiny but welcome maggot, doing their part to eat away at the rotting corpse that is the decaying universe. Those who do differentiate themselves invariably exemplify the precepts of Nurgle's philosophy and emulate its grand and corrupted form at a level that leaves no doubt as to which of the Runa's powers has claimed their souls. These are the Plague Father's mortal champions. And it is through their foul deeds that many of the greatest accomplishments of Nurgle's plan for the Great Corruption are achieved. So often these champions take on an appearance not unlike that of their dark patron. This is not unusual for minions of the Plague Father. Great unclean ones are said to be small, though still massive in their own right, versions of Nurgle itself, and in turn, their excreted offspring, the Nurglings, look like miniature replicas of the great unclean ones that gave them life. Likewise, mortal champions of the Plague Lord become bloated, stinking, leaking collections of rotted flesh, exposed entrails, necrotic sores, and all manner of foulness. They are surrounded by clouds of flies and followed by nurglings that splash about in the slime trails that spread out behind them to mark their passing. Unlike the minions of the other gods of chaos, Champions of Nurgle do not hesitate to pursue enemies into the most dank, disgusting, and polluted places. There is no cesspool or sewer noxious enough to deter Nurgle's followers. No quarantine plague zone is off limits. Once a champion of Nurgle has a scent of its foe, no amount of stink can throw it off. The determination that is such part and parcel of all that Nurgle's lessons impart serves its champions well, as they do whatever must be done to serve their lord. Lesser worshippers of Nurgle who follow them are unperturbed by the grotesque condition of its chaos champions and draw inspiration from the macabre beauty of their rotting forms, the sickly sweet odor of their rancid flesh, and the corruptive acts they commit in the name of Grandfather Nurgle. The Plague Lord's followers all end up mimicking its appearance in one way or another. Some even become its children, because they started out in life bearing some passing resemblance to it. Nurgle is more than form though, it is also philosophy. Most mortal Nurglide Chaos champions and many lesser followers end up thinking like it does, though in a limited fashion due to the constraints of mortal minds, but it is the demonic champions that know their father's thoughts the best. Great unclean ones understand Nurgle in a way that no mortal, not even one elevated to the rank of demon prince, ever could. They are nearer to their god than any mortal, and more closely involved in its plans than any plague bearer or other demonic servant. There is little place for jealousy or scheming in the Garden of Nurgle, or any of its domains beyond, and its demon princes know this. Though they wish for nothing more than to be one with the Plague Father, they also know they will never be as close to it as the Great Unclean Ones are. 
as they do with so much else as a result of Nurgle's teachings, they accept their lot. This relationship to their god differs from that of other demon princes. The other runers' powers take particular pleasure in deceiving mortals, damning them into their service by tricking them with lies and promises they know they will almost certainly never need to keep. They see their demonic followers, even their most powerful greater demons, as never having had a choice but to do as they are commanded. They view these demons more as slaves to darkness than co-conspirators with it. In their eyes, this makes mortal servants somehow more interesting. Nurgle, on the other hand, knows most of its mortal followers turn to him as a last act of desperation, but its demonic minions, most especially the great unclean ones, have genuine affection for Grandfather Nurgle and serve him out of love. Nurgle, for its part, delights in reciprocating, reminding it, as it does, of a kind of cycle and therefore the Plague Lord takes great interest and pride in the efforts of its demonic servants. The desires of Nurgle and its champions are one. Each knows that the great corruption is a higher purpose that must be served, and they do so with great resolve and satisfaction. A Great Game the major chaos gods are all ultimately after the same thing. Each wishes to overthrow the existing order of the universe and claim dominion over both the realm of chaos and the mortal world. The questions of how this is to be achieved and which lord the universe will call master are answered very differently by each of the dark gods. Stanesh would see all of existence turned into a playground in which it and its minions could eternally explore new delights. Corn desires nothing more than to claim every skull and drop of blood to use as the mortar with which to build the foundations of his new kingdom. Zinj surely has its own plans for what a twisted reality reshaped in its image would look like, but it has not shared what that might be. Perhaps it does not even know itself. To Nurgle, these alternatives are indistinguishable, self-indulgent fantasies with no sense of greater purpose or understanding of the nature of things. To wit, the ambitions of the others seem small. Reality will be remade. Both the mortal plane and the realm of chaos have ever been on a path of decay, and from decay come death and the end. The end, but not finality. It seems that Nurgle alone comprehends the meaning of this, the distinction. Where its brother gods each envision a destination at the end of the path, Nurgle knows that the journey turns ever back upon itself in a loop, leading to rebirth, revitalization, and new beginnings. It is this fundamental divergence of views that sets Nurgle at odds with the other Ruiner's powers, for it means that they are not actually working toward the same thing that it is. On the surface, it appears to the others that while the methods each employs may be different, the end result is much the same. The destruction of the Imperium of Man, the enslavement or destruction of all mortals, and final dominion over all existence. 
This is, though, a superficial understanding. Differences come to light in many ways. Sanesh is content to allow plague marines to inflict grievous damage on an army through blight and disease, but is then perplexed when Nurgle's servants do not allow the minions of the Prince of Pleasure to play with the wounded, absconding with their shattered forms before the lights can be explored. To Korn, it is all well and good to work with its brother Nurgle in an effort to blast a crude colony into oblivion, but it cannot fathom why the Plague Lord insists on leaving their former homeland untouched rather than raise it to a charred, lifeless stone. Still, these incidents pass written off as the eccentricities of their jolly brother. Zeej, however, is another matter entirely. It refuses to give Nurgle its due or to allow it to pursue its own path. It tweaks, twists and diverts. It warps, redirects and alters. The Lord of Change is unable to accept that which will surely come to pass. It is constantly looking to modify the rules to its advantage so that its desired ending is the one that will come to pass, even if that means interfering with Nurgle's desires, no matter how small the consequences of those desires may appear to be. Nurgle knows that such meddling is pointless. It knows that the journey down the path does not stop, but the machinations of its brother are vexing and irritating just the same. The actions of Korn and Slanesh are a small inconvenience, but Zinch's games play havoc with Nurgle's plans, creating setbacks that are needless and counterproductive to not only Nurgle's own goals, but also those of the other Dark Gods. Very little causes Nurgle's smile to dip, but Zinj seems to be able to provoke that reaction at will. When this universe dies and then rises again, it is one of the greatest hopes of the Lord of All that, like the Emperor of Mankind, Zinj will not be reborn with it. The Cult of Nurgle Nurgle is the mighty Lord of Decay, who presides over all physical corruption and morbidity in creation. Disease and putrefaction, the inevitable entropic decline of all things, are the favors it bestows upon the universe. It is to free themselves from despair the eternal mortal dread of disease, starvation and death, that humans and other mortals turn to the Plague Lord. Despite its horrific appearance, Nurgle is a warm, welcoming god, who prides itself on the achievements of its followers, gifting them with its most hideous diseases, even as it protects them from all pain and the cold sleep of death. The fear of death can be found in the hearts of all the sentient beings of the universe, and so there is no shortage of mortals of every species present in the galaxy willing to sacrifice their immortal souls in return for the corrupted preservation of their physical bodies for all time. Compared to the other Chaos Gods, Many of Nurgle's followers worship it by no choice of their own. The taint of Nurgle spreads readily among beasts and humanoids alike, and the awful arcane illness known as Nurgle's Rot may strike even the strongest person and cause him or her to be outcast as a leper. Despite the nature of its influence, Nurgle takes an interest in the victims of the diseases it unleashes, 
which it considers to be gifts, jovially caring for them in a manner similar to a loving grandfather, for which reason it is frequently referred to as Grandfather Nurgle by its servants. This also causes some that would have otherwise never been infected to seek out disease and even poison themselves to earn its favor. The deranged worshippers of the Lord of Pestilence say that it concocts diverse contagions to inflict on the material universe for its amusement, and many of the most infectious and horrible diseases are Nurgle's proudest creations. It is their belief that those who die caught in the grip of one of Nurgle's terrible poxes are swept directly to its domain, the land of the Plague Lord. Those that sing the praises of it loud enough are sometimes spared so that they can spread its blessings further, for the Church of the Fly Lord is always open to all. Nurgle has many supplicants, but there are few with the fortitude to declare themselves as its champions. The few that can survive the great corruptor's manifold blessings exhibit a feverish, morbid energy and a preternatural resistance to physical damage. Those that fashion themselves champions of Nurgle represent a dire threat to densely populated worlds where close-packed populations are vulnerable to a single contagion. Ships in the void are particularly vulnerable to disease, and many dying crews have beseeched the Lord of Decay for its intercession. Such was the fate of the Death Guard's Space Marine Legion when it became marooned in the warp on the long journey to Terra during the Horus Heresy. While they lay becalmed in the Immaterium, a mysterious contagion spread from one void ship to the next until the entire fleet was infected. Even the reinforced transhuman physiology of the Space Marines could not fight off the dire plague as it bloated the guts, distended the flesh, and rotted its victims from the inside. It is said that when even the Legion's Primarch, Mortarion, fell victim to the plague, he cried out to the ruiner's powers of chaos in his delirium. His desperation to save himself and his Legion called forth Nurgle and Mortarion became his greatest champion and demon prince. These Chaos Space Marines became known as the Plague Marines, Nurgle's most potent and prized mortal servants. Thus, the Death Guard Legion has enjoyed the favor of Nurgle for the last 10,000 standard years. The Allure of Nurgle Entropy is all-consuming, fed by all struggles against it. Thus, even to hope is to despair. So, despair, and in your desperation, find purpose. From Zlan's The Racked, a speaker of rot. Life anywhere in the unfeeling galaxy is harsh, miserable, and full of pain and suffering. Service to an uncaring god emperor or an eldritch and absent cosmic deity is ultimately empty and devoid of meaning. Men live and die, and for what? For others to stand on their graves and proselytize. Where is the reward in that? For those who accept the boundless gifts of the Father of Plagues, however, everlasting hope is the ultimate reward. Decay is unavoidable. Bolters rust, the shells they fire are spent, and the fingers that pull their trigger wear down with the passing of time and repeated action. 
Over the course of their lives, mortals sustain injuries, become infected, sicken and succumb to their wounds, or more simply, to age. It is impossible to escape deterioration, and yet, people try. The struggle to forestall decay moves people to action. It motivates them to greatness. It gives them hope that better times lie ahead. Endless possibilities in a universe that seemingly knows only certain crushing doom. It is the Plague Lord that brings light to the darkness. It is Nurgle that gives weak mortals the strength to resist the lies of the Ecclesiarchy and others. It is the embracing Grandfather Nurgle who encourages its followers to defy the doom of mortal corruption and instead use it as a source of strength and inspiration. In the marked squares of backward planets and in the drone-filled cathedrals of the chapters of the Adeptus Ministorum, preachers spew their lies upon an unsuspecting and dim-witted flock. They warn against corruption of the soul and filth of the spirit. They admonish their listeners that to turn from their faith is to join the ranks of the lost and the damned. Their work cannot encompass the horror of the truth. All Chaos Gods have a dual nature, but Nurgle, more so than any other of the Runer's powers, understands that the supposedly separate elements of its essence actually work together in a self-sustaining cycle rather than standing apart from one another as different explanations of the same thing. Korn, for instance, is a god of bloodshed and killing, of utter carnage, and also one of martial honor and a sense of accomplishment or betterment. These two halves can be seen as two sides of the same coin, but the coin must be flipped to view and appreciate its obverse. But this coin is illusory. There is no divide between its two faces, no beginning and no end. The coin is naught but a feeble mortal metaphor for the truth of Nurgle's influence. On one side there is decay, death and disease. What would be on the other side of this coin is in fact part and parcel of the first side. Hope, rebirth, resistance and growth all arise directly from facing death and decay. The seers of the Asuriani craft worlds and the inquisitors of the Imperium will never share this truth with the weak-minded fools who drink in their lies like mother's milk. For a Chaos God, Nurgle's actions seem oddly harmonious, caring even. To receive the blessings of Nurgle, all one has to do is want to live, and be willing to do whatever it takes to cling to that life. All else follows naturally from there. Worshippers of Korn must push toward ever greater levels of destruction and carnage despite the risks to themselves or even to their allies. Those who devote themselves to siege must deny their lot in life and seek to change everything, never appreciating what they have. Followers of Slanesh seek to escape reality in a blur of sensation and self-delusion. And yet, all that is required to feel the caring touch of Nurgle is to see life for what it is, and to want to make the most of it. All that is needed is faith in the future provided by Nurgle. While an invitation to stroll down its pox-strewn path should be welcomed as an honor, not all see it as such. Wasting away under the seemingly malign influence of a skin-eating disease is painful to the afflicted and often repulsive to those around them. 
When a child's flesh turns a sickly pale green, and her eyes glaze over and become dull, milky, unseeing orbs, her father comes to know that he is powerless to prevent her suffering. Seeing a friend's battlefield wound blacken and ooze blood-tinged pus, the stench of its rot choking the air of a barracks, is a reminder of the frailty of all mortals. If this decay comes at the hands of Nurgle, via the thrust of a rusted blade or the unleashing of a supernatural plague, many will curse its name. For those who are unable to see, this pain and suffering lifts the veil that hides the truth of life and death from them. Such moments and visions are terrifying. Some blessed mortals, however, are able to look beyond the putrescence and see the decay for what it is, a gift from the Lord of All. This gift, regardless of the form it takes, opens eyes even as it liquefies them. It simultaneously atrophies the leg muscles of its recipients and gives them the strength to march toward a greater purpose. It is Nurgle's great ambition to speed this universe towards its ultimate end by eroding the foundations of reality much as a disease can erode the spirits and bodies of those infected. Through its careful and ceaseless experimentations begun within its wondrous garden in the realm of chaos and then unleashed throughout the galaxy, the pillars that support the framework of existence are slowly but surely weakened. There will come a time when they collapse entirely and the universe will begin a massive transformation. The old ways will be swept aside like a troublesome fly, all that was will cease to be, and from the rotted ruins a new and glorious reality will emerge, one dominated by Nurgle and its beloved children. Those who walk with it and aid it in bringing about this great corruption, as Nurgle calls it, do so with joy in their hearts. They know that Nurgle's victory is assured and that when all things come to an end and life begins anew, they will have helped make it so. This makes theirs a life worth living, despite and because of the gifts of their caring master. Nurglish Corruption Rejoice, children! Your father brings you hope in your darkest hour. Let those who would accept his gifts come forth and receive the blessings of the Lord of Decay. Cast away your crutches and doubts. Put aside beliefs in a false master who fills your hearts with lies, sorrow, and regrets. Embrace instead the glorious gifts of rot and decay, revel in the beauty of putrescence, and be reborn a living symbol of perseverance. From the demon prince, Galfarth, addressing the diseased inhabitants of the conquered city of Kulis Seven. Nurgle, the Plague Lord is the psychic manifestation of the most predominant collective fear of all sentient beings, the fear of death. Nurgle is the embodiment of disease, decay, and the death these states ultimately bring to all living things. Most Nurglites rarely end up in the service of the Plague Lord willingly, for those who contract a deadly disease or are forced to face the reality of their own mortality, Nurgle offers a potential escape from the painful ravages of illness or an untimely death. In return for an individual's soul and their eternal damnation, 
Among all the major intelligence species of the galaxy, humanity fears death and the onset of non-existence the most, and it is humans who have always been the majority of the Plague Lord's servants. In return for their allegiance and service, it offers its worshippers complete immunity to all disease and pain by infecting them with every natural disease in existence and many that are unnatural extensions into real space of the arcane power of chaos. Champions of Nurgle can become among the most powerful chaos servants in the galaxy, though they will also be afflicted with some of the most all-encompassing and disgusting physical mutations that chaos can bestow. Nurglites become swollen, walking bags of pus and putrescence, their very skin swelling and rotting from their bones even as they continuously leak organic fluids infected with every loathsome bacteria, virus, fungus and infectious agent that can be conjured by the imagination. In return, Nurglites are completely immune to these diseases, or any disease, and their rotting bodies also become physically robust, capable of withstanding injuries and damage that would destroy even those enjoying the most robust health. At the same time, despite their seeming infirmity, those who have sworn their souls to Nurgle feel no pain. In fact, quite the opposite. For many Nurglides report feeling a sense of power and almost narcotic-like well-being that is far more pleasurable than they felt before the mutations began. And Nurgle's relationship with its brother gods. Nurgle is the age-old enemy of the Chaos God Zeech, the Lord of Change. Their animating psychic energies come from diametrically opposing mortal emotions and beliefs. Zeech's power derives from hope and the capacity of mortals to change their fortunes, while Nurgle's comes from defiance, born out of despair and hopelessness, at the inevitability of death. The followers of Nurgle often pit themselves against those of Zinj in complex political intrigues in the mortal realm, forever attempting to mire its schemes for change in dull-minded conservatism and parochial self-interest. The corrupting influence of Nurgle's servants is often successful in thwarting the architect of fate and they erode its accomplishments constantly, safe in the knowledge that whatever survives the collapse into entropy becomes their inheritance. Nurgle and Zinj are in many ways opposed. For at the heart of the matter, the Changer of Ways seeks to build ever more complex and improbable webs of power, while Nurgle embodies continuous growth, destruction, and renewal. The war between the two powers is ceaseless and played out across countless realities. That which Zinj creates and evolves to undreamed of heights of complexity and insane perfection, Nurgle's servants gnaw away at, seeking to bring the entire edifice toppling down so that new growth can emerge from the fecund grave. The Land of the Plague Lord. In this universe, all rots. In this universe, one must rot to survive. 
an excerpt from the enlightenment of Corvid Calthrax, a harbinger of carrion. The land of the Plague Lord, often better known as the Garden of Nurgle, is no ordinary garden. Perhaps it is not really a garden at all, but the mortal minds that contemplate the manifested will of the Plague Lord must attempt to make some sort of sense out of what they have seen or heard about in whispered tales. They must place it in some sort of relatable context that they can consider without going insane. The same tomes and other forbidden texts that have attempted to describe the lord of the land himself have, for the most part, agreed that the idea of Nurgle's realm being a perverse, deadly, and yet strangely beautiful garden best puts chaos into terms they can fathom. Like a normal garden, the domain of Nurgle is home to a bewildering array of flora and fauna, all interconnected and supporting the whole. Beds of bright blue shovel petal plants dig themselves up and leave the dirt in which they grew so that plague bearers can plant new skull seeds in the rich loam. As the skull seeds grow and blossom, they attract bounding, stomping, over-exuberant beasts of Nurgle that mistake their fruits for the heads of new playthings. This scatters their matter violently into the air, where it comes to rest on the wings of the ubiquitous flies. Slowed by the sticky pulp of the splattered plants, these insects become easy prey for other flying creatures that ingest them as they soar through the rot-choked air. Unbeknownst to the predators, Bloatflies are carriers of many of Nurgle's experimental diseases and other creations. With their innards thus infected, these predators sicken, vomiting the contents of their guts all across the garden as they fly about and eventually explode in showers of life-giving flesh and blood. This bounty of mutated and mutilated tissue falls into new areas of the garden beneath, decaying into compost and starting the cycle of life and death anew. Though the Garden of Nurgle does share certain commonalities with gardens and jungles on planets in real space, it still is not a worldly garden in any sane sense. A visitor in this bizarre and perilous realm doesn't walk from this place to that. They experience what needs to be experienced. Even the demons that tend to the Garden of Nurgle are not really what might be thought of as a workforce to the rise at the place, does a job, and then leaves for other regions. These demons are a part of the experience of the garden itself. This is especially troublesome for the plague bearers, whose metamorphosed minds were once mortal and still strive to impose a modicum of reality in their unreal existences. Still, even the plague bearers accept their place in the garden and spend their eternity enjoying all it offers in their own way. The plague father affords all its children many ways to explore and appreciate its realm, and even to become a part of it. Though it is a god of chaos, it also has a need to create order, to monitor its creations, and to control its experiments. 
A visitor to its realm would find a dizzying amount of diversity of experiences. Here they might find trees made of nothing but the flesh of Eldari, constantly oozing the tears of a dying race. There they might find fields where tongues sprout up from the earth, each one blistered by the malign influence of a different infection. There is no telling what wonders await around each bend in the pass that stretch and wind throughout the Garden of Nurgle, but any who encounter them will surely have their sanity tested and questioned should they survive to share the tale. This land is an ever-changing realm shifting according to the needs and whims of its master. Many areas exist only temporarily, taking shape to allow the play god to indulge a particular fancy, or to be granted to an especially accomplished great unclean one as a reward. Even so, the legends hint that some aspects of this footed domain remain relatively constant. Nurgle has need of fields in which to plant its crops of blighted herbs, pits to hold the bodies upon which it conducts its experiments, and most important of all, a gigantic and decrepit mansion in which to store its creations, brew its legendary contagions, entertain guests, and plot the course of the great corruption. While the mortal realm is laid waste by blight and pestilence, the lands of Nurgle and the realm of chaos thrive on disease and corruption. Tended by the Lord of Decay, this unwholesome realm is home to every pox and affliction imaginable, and is foated with the stench of rot. Twisted, rotten boughs and tangled with grasping vines cover the mouldering ground. Entwining like broken fingers, fungi, both plain and spectacular, break through the squelching mulch of the forest floor, puffing out clouds of choking spores. The stems of half-demonic plants wave off their own accord, unstirred by the insect-choked air. Their colors puncture the gloom, havens of cheeriness in a dismal woodland. Human-featured beetles flit along the banks of sluggish, muddy rivers. Reeds rattle whispering the names of the poxes inflicted upon the worlds of mortals by Great Nurgle, or lamenting those that have died from the caress of their creator. Jutting from amidst this primordial mire is Nurgle's man's. Decrepit and ancient, yet eternally strong at its foundations, the mansion is an eclectic structure of rotted timbers and broken walls, overgrown with crawling poison ivy and thick mosses. Cracked windows and crumbling stone compete with verdigris coated bronze, rusted ironwork, and lesion covered cornices to outdo each other with their corrupted charm. Within these tumbling walls, Nurgle toils. Beneath mildewed and sacking beams, the great god works for eternity at a rusted cauldron. A receptacle vast enough to contain all the oceans of all the worlds. Chuckling and murmuring to itself, Nurgle labors to create contagion and pestilence, the most sublime and unfettered forms of life. 
with every stir of Nurgle's maggot-ridden ladle, a dozen fresh diseases flourish and are scattered through the stars. From time to time, it reaches down with a clawed hand to scoop a portion of the ghastly mixture into its cavernous mouth, tasting the fruits of its labor. With each passing day, it comes closer to brewing its perfect disease, a spiritual plague that will spread across the extent of the universe and see all living things gathered unto its rotting embrace. Dwarfed by their mighty lord, a host of plague bearers are gathered about it, each chant sonorously, keeping count of the diseases created the mischievous nurglings that have hatched, and the souls claimed by the Lord of Decay's putrid blessings. This hum drowns out the creaking of the rotten floor and the scrape of the ladle on the cauldron, so eternal in its monotony that to hear it is to invite madness. When its diseases wax strong in the mortal realm, its garden blooms with death's heads and fresh filth, encroaching upon the lands of the other Chaos Gods. War follows as Nurgle's adversaries fight back, and the plague bearers take up arms to defend the morbid forest. From such war springs more of the richness of life and death, of triumph over adversity. Though Nurgle's realm will eventually recede again, it will have fed deeply on the fallen and will lie in gestate peace until it is ready to swell throughout time and space once more. The Mansion of the Plague Lord There is a house of decay at the center of Nurgle's garden. Its racked and twisted structure creaks and groans under the influence of baleful, toxic winds. Shutters cling just barely to window frames, only half filled with broken panes of filth-covered glass. Sewage drains spill forth beetles, maggots, and twisted centipedes with only tongues for their bodies and human fingers for legs. Paint continually cracks and peels away from the wood beneath, yet the house never loses its grey-green hue. Along the roof, Hundreds of chimneys bellow out dark clouds that, upon close inspection, are composed of millions of floating, buzzing flies. All around this house, trees made of bone bear fruit that rots even as it swells. The leafless boughs of these ancient trees provide shelter for demonic birds that sing the funeral dirges of any unwelcome visitor. It is a house of pestilence, rot, and death. This is Nurgle's Mansion, also called the Mansion of the Plague Lord. And that means that it is also a place of hope and renewal. There can be no explanation for the strength that keeps this structure from collapse, save that it is the dwelling place of the Lord of All, whose boundless energy, sense of eternal purpose, and limitless joy for its work finds perfect peace with the inevitability of decay. Nurgle itself often sits in a massive chair just to the side of the mansion's front door. From there, it entreats visitors, both summoned and unexpected, to approach, share tales and questionable libations, and explore the countless rooms within. Inside the vast structure, a guest could easily become lost. 
rotten floorboards send many to a doom of slow consumption by the carrion feeders that dwell in the lower levels. Grand staircases decorated with moth-eaten rugs beckon to wandering souls, leading them to chambers where demons are glad to receive new, fresh flesh. Should the guest bypass these rooms and continue upward, they might find their way to the attic, where Nurgle keeps samples of its multitudinous works of decay, catalogued and countered over and over again by attendant plague bearers. This attic are jars containing the viscera of plague victims from across time and space. Souls are trapped within apparently simple glass containers, left to slowly dim and fade as maladies of the spirit waste them to the bone. If the visitor walked past the stairs and pushed deeper into the mansion, they might stumble upon the kitchens and larders of the Plague Lord's home. Every foul ingredient, every pestilent component imaginable, and some that defy sanity rest on shelves here, neatly labeled and ready to be combined in the great cauldron. A wise guest moves on quickly from here, knowing that to linger is to become flavoring for the noxious stew, for this cauldron is among Nurgle's prized possessions and it likes to keep it full. It is in this great black crucible that the lord of all brews the many plagues it pours into the mortal realm. Nurgle is a creative being, and it will take inspiration for experimentation where it finds it. Seldom can it resist the temptation to add nearby visitors to its virulent concoctions. The Vibrant Grounds of a Morbid Estate Nurgle is, unlike the other Ruiner's powers in many ways, including how it views its domain within the realm of chaos. Corn, for instance, rarely leaves its throne barking orders to its generals from atop a mound of skulls. Slanesh watches the happenings of its kingdom from within its palace of pleasure, or wanders the universe, seeking to tempt mortals into giving up their souls to satisfy its hunger. Zinj seems to not care much at all for the state of its warped and fractured lands, spending its time plotting and interfering with affairs in realms beyond its own. Now Nurgle, on the other hand, cherishes the beauty and surprises of its garden. It routinely takes strolls down its twisted paths, cavorting with its demons and stopping to observe as one of its diseases takes its toll on a wounded captive. Nurgle is in touch with its land and its many regions. In its wanderings outside of the mansion, it passes by some of its favorite places, many of which have existed since Nurgle first thought of them and are likely to be the models for the reborn universe that is to come. A moment's journey from the mansion are the deathbeds, a place it visits more often than perhaps any other. It is a place that serves two purposes. Not only are wayward travelers and defeated invaders trapped here, stored in the deep pits and sucking muck of this place, awaiting some future foul use or their eventual demise, but it is here that Nurgle can indulge in one of its greatest forms of entertainment. The Plague Lord loves to hear stories of the realms beyond its own. They inspire it to create new pestilences that are well suited to other lands, 
and in the deathbeds, it has countless potential storytellers. Sometimes it offers these unfortunates the chance to improve their position by spitting the worms from their mouths and sharing tales of their worlds with it. Those who amuse it sufficiently are plucked from the muck and removed to the mansion. There they have the great honor of becoming vessels for Nurgle's newest plagues. Once they are properly infected, Grandfather Nurgle smiles, giving them one last tender, gut-churning embrace, and send them back into the lands their stories described. After visiting the deathbeds, Nurgle often makes the Poxyards the next stop on its stroll. It is here that it tests the efficiency of its contagions of the flesh and spirit. Each malady requires a different set of trials to gauge its ability to achieve the Plague Lord's desires. This means that the physical form of the Poxyards changes to suit the task. For a test of the spirit, this region of the garden may be filled with crystal clear lakes. A dehydrated test subject may see these lakes and, believing salvation is at hand, drink deeply of the cool waters. Suddenly, the water will turn to pus, tormenting the sick and weakened soul. For a test of a skin-eating disease, the poxyards may be filled with claw-thrust brambles. Infected captives can be sent running into the demon plants, chased by beasts of Nurgle. If the captives scream as they pass through the razor-edged branches of the plants, then Nurgle knows that the poor wretches can still feel pain and its affliction needs refinement. No matter the incarnation of the Poxyard, this corner of the garden always gives Nurgle new insights, and therefore it spends a great deal of time there. There are other places such as these, places that are always buzzing with activity and joy. The Morabusium, where the most precious and toxic herbs take root. The Dunglash Arboretum, where refined excrement hangs from trees like putrid, reeking vines and many others. All of these regions provide Nurgle with the ingredients and insights it needs to further its work at the cauldron when it returns to the mansion after one of its invigorating jaunts. The Realm of a Million and One Plagues In addition to the mainstay regions of the land of the Plague Lord, there are many others that enjoy a less permanent existence, coming and going with the ascendancy and passing of one of Nurgle's many plagues. Some of these likely only exist in the nightmare visions and untrustworthy hallucinations of disease-ravaged minds. Still, the Garden of Nurgle is near infinite, and it is not so unbelievable that a recipient of one of its great gifts might be blessed with a fleeting glimpse of the Plague Lord's realm. With their last dying breaths, some mortals gasp and choke out words, saying that they hear faint bells tolling. Perhaps they refer to the blossoms that grow in the death bell lily fields. When a mortal dies as a result of one of Nurgle's many diseases, one of these pallid flowers opens up and emits a tiny chime to mark the success of Nurgle's handiwork. The ringing is incessant. The hanging gardens of Tush Bolg are a sight to be seen. This remote slice of Nurgle's realm was given to the great unclean one 
Tosh Bulg as acknowledgement of its use of choking plague to wipe out an orc infestation on Hurax, a planet that Nurgle coveted. To commemorate its victory and to demonstrate constant thanks to its lord for its reward, Tosh Bulg used its own intestines to hang every single orc from the colony in the trees of its domain. There, they dangle and rot, slowly dying, but never quite finding release. Plague bells toss organs from the bodies of diseased victims into sorting pools, making it easier for them to count the numbers that have died from each ailment. Beasts of Nurgle frolic in fields where planted spines yield crops of dementia-inducing foodstuffs. Nurglings cackle with glee as they roll down hillsides that form spontaneously when great unclean ones vomit up regimens they consumed thousands of standard years ago. The land of the Plague Lord is a wondrous place filled with vitality, mirth, and experiences beyond mortal comprehension. It is a playground for the minions of the Lord of Decay, a laboratory for its work, and a comforting home for a god that knows its realm is the shape of things to come. The Caged Maiden the Eldari believe that when Slanesh, the Lord of Pleasure, awoke in the early 30th millennium, their gods were destroyed outright. Yet there is one myth upon a single craft world that tells of how the maiden goddess, Isha, was not slain by the Dark Prince and absorbed by it like the rest of the Eldari pantheon after its birth during the fall. Slanesh vanquished her as he had all of the other Eldari gods within the warp, but only took her prisoner rather than absorbing her energies outright. What foul purpose it had in keeping Isha alive None amongst the Eldari now know, but the Prince of Pleasure was ultimately denied its spoils. For some reason, Nurgle, the Plague Lord, waged war against Slanesh to rescue the Eldari Goddess. Why Grandfather Nurgle intervened is unclear although some Eldari scholars believe that one of the oldest of the major chaos gods wanted to give the youngest amongst them a good lesson about its proper place in the order of things. What is known is that Nurgle's demonic forces proved victorious, and it took the Eldari goddess back to its domain in the realm of chaos. A goddess of fertility and rejuvenation, and a god of decay, seemed an odd pairing, but Nurgle came to adore its new companion like no other being in the universe. And yet, the adoration of a chaos god is a strange thing, for Nurgle shows its affection in cruel ways. It keeps her imprisoned in a rusted cage in the corner of its cauldron chamber within its personal mass. It is there that it keeps the cauldron where it mixes the elements that create all of its plagues and pestilences. When the plague god creates a particularly pleasing brew, it forces Isha to imbibe the putrid mixture, watching with building excitement for the symptoms of its latest contagion. Though as the goddess of healing, Isha can cure herself of the disease's ravages, the speed with which she is free from its grip allows the Plague Lord to evaluate its creation's virulence. If Nurgle is pleased, 
It returns to its cauldron and empties its contents into a bottomless drain, the noxious liquid falling as rain upon one of the mortal worlds. If the concoction does not meet with its approval, it gulps down the contents of the cauldron, vomits it back into the pots, and starts afresh. While the Plague Lord is busy at its cauldron, Isha accepts her lot stoically, and fights back against the Lord of Decay's evil in the same way she once fought against Cain, whispering the cures to these new diseases into the universe so that mortals might know them and resist the hideous designs of Grandfather Nurgle. Uninvited Guests Very few mortal eyes have beheld the land of the Plague Lord. Its swamplands constantly wheeze a fog of supernatural diseases, and living beings cannot endure so much as a single breath of its repugnance. Only Nurgle itself can spare visitors from its garden's toxic affections. When it is expecting company, it will open a path through the gurgling fungus fronds with a single magnanimous gesture. Trespassers are viewed poorly in Nurgle's domain, as the seers of Luganath found to their cost. The Eldari of that far-flung craft world have long told the story of the Caged Maiden, wherein Isha, the goddess of fertility and healing, is imprisoned in Nurgle's mansion at the mercy of her grotesque admirer. These Asuriani believe their legends to be absolute truth, and even aspire to one day free their goddess from Nurgle's unctuous grasp. So it was that when Luganath was ravaged by the brittle coma, an army of its most gifted psychers cast their minds into the realm of Nurgle in pursuit of the truth of the myth of Isha's captivity, hoping to find their lost goddess and put a halt to their craft world's deadly malaise with her freedom. They knew that they would almost certainly die in the attempt, but believed that their souls would ultimately be drawn back into the glittering spirit stones of their comatose bodies. Once safe in their crystal afterlife, they could impart Isha's message to the spirit seers and lift Nurgle's curse from their homes. At first, their astrally projected forms appeared to be able to pass through the grasping foliage of Nurgle's garden with ease. Their ghost helms kept them as insubstantial as spirits, and their rune-shielded minds cut through the dismal vegetation, for they were sharper than any corporeal blade. The rot flies of that realm buzzed loud in alarm, however, and whispered of the intruders into Nurgle's ear. Just as the seers of Luganath sighted Grandfather Nurgle's mans in the distance, a great host of plague bearers rose up from the mud and began to chant in a droning monotone as they came forward. The seers channel their psychic energy into great blasts of cleansing blue fire, boiling away huge chunks of Nurgle's army and darting out of the clumsy reach of their foes. But ever more plague bearers emerge from the slurry to block their path. The battle raged for solar days, and swaths of Nurgle's garden were blasted to ruin in the process. However, in the material dimension, the physical form of the trespassing seers began to convulse and shake, succumbing to the very plague they hoped to overcome. 
Slowly, as their bodies shriveled and their spirit stones turned to rotting mulch, the souls of the seers that were trapped in Nurgle's realm began to pass fully into the Immaterium. The soupy air of the garden seeped into their lungs, worm-riddled mud spattered up their legs, and white-bodied demon flies clamored into their mouths. Claimed at last, the seer's feet took root as their faces hardened into bark, their arms split and twisted into gnarled branches, each finger hung with ripening, nurgling fruit. The seers of Luganath remained there still, a copse of wailing trees that brighten Nurgle's leisurely walks and strike a note of despair into the heart of Isha, its immortal captive. Such is the fate of those who enter uninvited into the land of the Plague Lord, for even the generosity of the Grandfather of Plagues has its limit.